So, hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and it is your weekly space hangout for Friday, April 26, 2013. There's a cat there, right there. Uh, so today we've got a, a, so many stories, I am going to be amazed if we'll be able to make it through them. So if you feel a certain sense of urgency from me, uh, that's because there's a ton of stories. We've got a new test of general relativity. We've got meteors hitting Saturn's rings. We've got observations of Betelgeuse. We've got, uh, let's see, uh, Hubble observations of Comet Ison. We've got uh, progress arriving at the International Space Station with a few glitches. Uh, we've got a lunar eclipse that just happened, uh, the launch of the Antares rocket, uh, and the test of the grasshopper, and more. So uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking about a lot of stuff. So joining me, fortunately, we've got lots of help. Uh, so we've got my good friend Jason Major. Uh, we've got Dr. Matthew Francis, who joined us last week and is back with... Uh, uh, who's the cat? Oh, you're muted, I think. The, the cat is Dr. Matthew Francis. Who's Dr. Matthew? Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. The cat is actually in that Futurama episode, right? This, this, yeah. is, this is Pascal, and I will, I will remove him before he starts yelling, which is what he's likely to do. <laughs> awesome. We've got Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. Nancy. We've got Dr. Nicole Gallucci, Hello. a.k.a. the Noisy Astronomer from CosmoQuest. And we've got Scott Lewis, hey, everyone. my uh, partner in crime with the uh, Virtual Star Party. That's right. Uh, okay, so well then we're just going to start with, uh, I think we'll start with Nicole, and we're going to talk about this really cool uh, test of general rel relativity. Pulsars, 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 pulsars are awesome. <coughs> okay, so this story broke uh, yesterday. Um, oh, I don't know if you mentioned about comments. If you want to comment, uh, oh, right, do it of in course. YouTube. I, I, doing a terrible job. Let me get. Oh, no, no, no. So yeah, we, we, we love your comments. We love to ask, ask, you know, incorporate your questions into the show. So if you want to do that, you can go to. Uh, uh, if you're watching this on the event page on Google Plus, you can post your comments there. If you're watching this on the stream somewhere, you can post your comments just in Google Plus on the stream. Hopefully, we'll get it. I can't guarantee that. Uh, also, if you're watching this somewhere and you just want to use. Twitter, you can use the hashtag Space Hangout, or you can uh, use it on, you can post a comment on YouTube. YouTube's probably the safest place, so we'll absolutely make it, we'll catch it on YouTube. So uh, go ahead and post any questions. Although I'm not sure we're actually getting the YouTube video automatically, actually, now that I think about uh, it. It was comments. already listed there. Yeah. It's taking its sweet old time if it is. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's a comment. Thank you, there Tyler. You go. Post your comments. <laughs> awesome. All right. All uh, right. So, Pulsars, Pulsars. When last we saw our heroes, it was Pulsars, Pulsars are awesome, I believe. Pulsars, Pulsars, Pulsars. So there was a Pulsar pair discovered. It's actually a Pulsar and a White Dwarf Star. And the Pulsar has the name of PSR J0348 plus 0432, of course. Of uh, course. This, is a, an, a, this is a very interesting system because it's uh, usually they do this test with Pulsar, Pulsar binaries. This is uh, a very close binary of a White Dwarf and a Pulsar. Pulsar is a neutron star, so it's this very dense material. Uh, it's so dense that it's all compacted, all, all the uh, particles into neutrons. And it's got this, um, these beams of light spinning out of both sides. And as it's spinning, it's spinning very rapidly. This one's on the order of 30 milliseconds. This is a very rapidly spinning pulsar. Um, and it's, or, it, it's got a white dwarf orbiting it. And so they were able to, a uh, group of scientists, including a bunch of my friends from, from University of Virginia and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, um, uh, they detected the system with the Green Bank Telescope, and then they did, did follow-up using optical telescopes, um, uh, I want to say at Apache Point, as well as uh, um, Arecibo, the Arecibo Radio Telescope. And they found out a couple of interesting things about this system. First and the VLT all, in Chile. And the VLT. Right, the VLT in Chile. Thank you. Uh, so they discovered a couple interesting things about this system. First of all, they were able to uh, determine the masses of the pulsar and the white dwarf with extreme precision. That's really hard to do. And so they discovered that the pulsar was two solar masses. Um, and then they used a technique called pulsar timing, where you actually, they actually measure the time that each pulse comes in from the pulsar with an accuracy of 10 micro, uh, no, 10, 10 microseconds. So with an accuracy of 10 microseconds, they can get the exact orbits and the exact motion of this system. One thing that they found is that uh, they could use this to test a regime of general relativity that they haven't been able to test before. The general relativity is this theory of gravity that seems to work in all cases, but we know it probably breaks down somewhere because it doesn't mesh with quantum mechanics, right? And so physicists are looking for this grand unified theory of everything, uh, and so they're seeing to 
looking to find the places where general relativity is going to break. Turns out this was not the place. <laughs> Einstein uh, but, was right again. Einstein was right again. But it's 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 a new search space uh, that has been that has been um, probed that way. Um, I think Matthew, maybe you, you're a little bit more better schooled on general relativity than I am. If you want to talk about some of the implications. Well, one of the things that's really interesting about this particular uh, pulsar is, well, the thing, well, one thing, back up for a second, one thing that is interesting about pulsars in general is that they are so small in relation to their mass. Um, so a pulsar, did you already say this, Nicole, mm -hmm. the, about the size of pulsars? Not about the size, no, just the okay. mass and the density. Um, they, they have the mass, this one is about twice the mass of our sun. Almost, but yes. Very exactly measured. Almost, yeah, almost, it's it's really it's really interesting how close it is to almost exactly twice. Yeah. But it's but based on what we know about it, it's probably about the size of a city on Earth. So you're talking about the mass packed into something that you know, you know is is just about ten kilometers across, maybe twenty kilometers across. Um, and so that means, and and that's going to be true. Uh, that size is going to be roughly true no matter what the mass of the neutron uh, the pulsar is. Mm -hmm. So therefore, a neutron star is another name for a pulsar. So what that means is when you have something that's a high mass pulsar like this, that means the gravity near its surface is going to be about twice as intense as a similar mass as as a smaller mass pulsar, which are the ones that we've studied more. So what that means is when those when those pulses that Nicole talked about are being emitted, they're going to actually be slowed down as they pass out of the uh, gravitational field of the pulsar. So that provides an extremely precise measure of the effect of gravity on on these pulses of light. Um, and that's in addition to the decay of the orbit. Its companion is a white dwarf. So as these objects orbit around each other, they're emitting gravitational waves and they're getting closer together. So you've got actually two different ways in which they are, uh, 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 in which uh, gravity is, is uh, providing us tests of general relativity. And general relativity is passed. We've got really tight constraints on any other theory that, that would predict different results. So yeah, this um, so this being in a in a binary system, what the the pulsar has been doing, they've been able to figure out the pretty much the exact history of this system as they get spin closer as they get closer together. Um, the pulsar increases its spin, and that's how you get a millisecond pulsar. That's how you get a pulsar that spins several thousand times a second, hundred to thousand times a second. Um, the other thing is that they use this to test. Um, I'm not sure about the details of this. Um, they, they wanted to test the regime where gravity waves can eventually be detected by future instruments such as LIGO. And so what they found is that um, the, planned, um, the, the planned instruments for detecting gravity waves are consistent with the results that they found from the decay of the orbit of this particular pulsar, pul pulsar pair. And so that's good. Yay, the instruments they're working on will probably be looking in the right search space for gravity waves. Right. I mean, if, if I understand correctly, if I remember the things that Pamela has taught me, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the gravity waves, I mean, these are still f theoretical. They've been observed in these kinds of pulsar binaries, objects like this, but we haven't actually detected them passing through the instruments here on Earth, even though there have been some experiments. So, you know, this, this further constraint of what a gravity wave is going to look like as it passes through these instruments on Earth will really help to be able to to discover them. So I think that's great. Yeah, and like I said, the, the pulsar timing techniques, they get that down to 10 microseconds of the, of exact, within 10 microseconds of when exactly the pulses come in. And so that's incredible right. precision. You have to take out the motion of the Earth, the motion of the solar system, all of this is juicy right. stuff. I'm going to include a link to how pulsar sure. timing works for those of you who like math in the yeah. comments. Two, so can so ignore it. <laughs> the, 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 the gist of this is Einstein, still right. And still pulsar is still awesome. <laughs> still awesome. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. So, Jason, you've got a story of some cool meteors hitting Saturn's rings. Yeah, well, let's, you know, let's come back from the uh, depths of the galaxy and the universe uh, down to our own solar system. Um, so we know that there are always meteors uh, striking Earth 
uh, striking the moon, striking all the planets, really. Um, I mean, one of the estimates is that, like, every day, 100 tons of uh, just space junk, space dust and bits and rocks and stuff like that comes, you know, landing on Earth and, and contributes to the mass of our planet. Well, that's happening not just here, not just on the moon, but also out in the solar system as well, past the asteroid belt. Um, and a planet like Saturn is going to have, well, with all of the extra size and surface area, and the rings, of course, are going to add you know, to that exponentially, it's going to be getting hit by meteors, too. But they haven't really known uh, how often this is happening until the, um, the uh, uh, equinox of Saturn back in 2009. Um, and that's when, during, basically during Saturn's springtime, the light from the sun is hitting it at a, at a you know, angle right, right, against the, uh, right against the ring plane there. And what that does is it highlights all of the relief in the rings. Anything that's happening there really, really gets a spotlight on it. So by looking at the images that came back from Cassini from back in 2009, um, the mission scientists were able to see, and let me pop up this, uh, this picture here. What we're looking at is these bright streaks and, and, and bright spots in the rings are actually the uh, remnants of meteor hits. And so what happens is, is as the meteor strikes the rings, it kicks up all of that, it kicks up all of that bright ring material. And because the rings are always moving, that stuff eventually gets pulled and sheared into these, into these long bands, these long streaks. It almost looks like what we would see here on Earth up in the sky when, when a shooting star comes down, you get this long streak. Well, you know, it's kind of like it gets frozen in time. You know, I mean, I'm just using this as, a, as an artistic license here, but that's what it ends up looking like. Really what that is is the cloud of, the cloud of ring stuff getting kicked up, highlighted by the sun at that angle, and stretched out into this long, long, you know, this long band. And um, so that's, you know, by looking at that, they're able to say, okay, well, you know, this is, this is how often Saturn's rings are getting hit by meteors and what happens and how fast the material in the rings is actually moving. So it, 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 um, it doesn't take long for that thing to get stretched out either. It's only, you know, within maybe one orbit around Saturn, one and a half orbits, you go from a round cloud of dust, a poof, to something that's, you know, stretched out thousands and thousands of kilometers. So it, it's, kind of, it's kind of amazing that there's actually a collision happening at all. When you think about, you know, from, from this far away when we see the rings, they, they really look like a solid object, but I know as you get closer it's really just a collection of chunks of ice and dust and, and stuff. And so you can think about the actual size of the particles and the density of them with these meteorites moving through, the mm -hmm. chances of one actually striking is probably not that common, but I guess there's right. so much material passing so through the rings. There's so much material, and the so rings fine, are so big. And it's so bright because it's all made of particles of water ice, so as soon as that, that basically that hoof happens, that stuff gets kicked out, hovers there for a while, it all goes into orbit around Saturn along with everything else, and, um, and it gets lit up by the rings, I mean lit up by the sun, you know, during that equinox period. Right, yeah. it's scattering all that light all over the place. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a and, question. And, oh, oh go ahead. Question. question. Mole asking, uh, at what speed are the rings of Saturn traveling? Oh, Do we have an? Uh, does anyone have an idea? Well, they travel with the orbit of Saturn. motion around Saturn. Well, Saturn is. How They're fast all is traveling it at different speeds. Right. Yeah. So you know. Thank you for And that's why the shear effect happens. Now, uh, the the average, you know, the average speed. Well, let's see here on Earth, uh, an orbital speed is seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Um, on Saturn, it would be, you know, wherever they happen to be in in uh, altitude. Right. Really, how far out the rings are going. Closer into Saturn, those particles are moving faster than. The, well, actually, no. Closer into Saturn, the particles are moving slower. Further out, they're moving faster. And then you've got Saturn's movement around the sun, but then you've got the micrometeorites. Who knows what direction they're coming from? So, yeah, so, I mean, there's all kinds of combinations that can happen. Uh, and you had another picture. I just wanted to sort of switch. You had another picture you're going to show oh, yes. as well oh, yeah, of that awesome. infrared Ready image of, of Saturn. Super cool here. <laughs> yeah, this is beautiful. <laughs> We're super hot. For being all right. Excited. This here is an infrared image of Saturn taken from the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Um, by University of Leicester scientists James Donahue and Dr. Tom Stallard uh, this past Sunday 
there was there was an observation. Um, well, there's going to be a series of observations using Keck's infrared ability to look at Saturn and see the heat, heat signatures there. And um, well, I mean, you can just see right here how how gorgeous this is. You know, uh, the planet itself tends to disappear right into the blackness because it's not reflecting nearly as much light and 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 nearly as much infrared radiation as some of these uh, segments of rings. Um, but this is just gorgeous. Now, this is uh, this image here is is tipped 90 degrees from the original, but it's just you know it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So we're seeing the inner rings glowing a lot hotter. You're seeing the but inner rings glowing, off. yeah. Um, I w I would have to, and I'm you know I'm just making an un uneducated guess here. Uh, I would have to think that the inner rings are brighter because they're probably denser and probably reflecting a lot more visible as well as infrared radiation back at us. Um, the same thing as the outermost ring, and, and I want to say that's either the edge of the A ring or the F ring all by itself. Is all it right, a reflection well, or is it, or is it emission because it's, it's so warm? I think it's emission. Yeah. It looks like emission, but I, I don't know anything about the physics going on here. Well, if it's getting if it's getting optical reflection back, isn't there a possibility that it's also reflecting a bit of infrared back as well? Sure, but that's not what this looks like. That's that's, that's yeah, my especially with the density it. there around the around the planet. It definitely looks like it's it's emitting that, and I don't know if it just has to do with the amount of of energy that's there just because of the. Um, of the tidal forces and anything like that going on. I think on. We're, we, without knowing more about the observation, we're speculating, but it's pretty. That's what's it's important. It's pretty. It's pretty. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Yeah. So we've been joined by Alan Boyle, which is awesome from Cosmic. Hi. Hi. So, sorry, I was late. Uh, technical difficulties. So. Oh, no problem. And I think now you have a silly picture that you're going to share. Oh, I, I'm. That's part of the technical difficulties that I can't actually share it. But uh, let me see I if can I share it. Scott can, <laughs> can, it Scott right can share it. Then you okay. Scott can Absolutely. share it, and you care. can talk about it. Oh, all right, hey. everybody. Uh -huh. The the uh, phallus on Mars. Uh, that uh, this this uh, picture actually is from uh, 2004, shortly after the Spirit rover landed. But it uh, generated a new wave of hilarity this week when. And it started popping up, so to speak. Uh, uh, and and uh, it looks—it looks like a, a little piece of anatomy there. Uh, and so people were, uh, you know, there were some uh, reports like uh, the Sun or the Daily Mail saying that, gee, those NASA uh, rover operators must be getting bored. There, there is actually a, a TV host in in Britain who who uh, hosts a racing show, and so he. Uh, did some uh, tire tracks that that uh, looked like a male member as a joke, and so everyone picked up on that and thought that the NASA rover drivers were doing the same thing. Well, it turns out that this is uh, just the standard uh, pattern that uh, the rover leaves behind when it uh, goes along a track and then has to turn its its wheels around, and so you could see this pattern many, many, many times on Mars, but. But uh, you realize uh, they're so sophomoric. They're that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, there's a rover, uh, a well-known rover driver, Scott Maxwell, who says mm -hmm. that he thinks he had a role in actually uh, doing this particular pattern, uh, and is very proud of it. <laughs> so <laughs> that sounds like Scott. Uh, you know, yeah. it doesn't doesn't really have any uh, it doesn't really have any uh, scientific uh, relevance. It's an interesting little engineering. Uh, Penis paradolia. That's right. Penis, Penis paradolia. paradolia. I like it. I like That's it. Awesome. I gotta say, Alan, this gives a new meaning to the term space junk. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they say I I'm bring all the like, oh, humor. Oh. Look at you guys. <laughs> One of hey. the Twitter commenters said uh, that uh, you might think that there's a phallus on Mars, but it's actually a fallacy. Nah. <laughs> that was me. That was you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that was me. Although I, I think I stole the joke from Terry Pratchett. I may be wrong on that, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 the joke is not uh, not entirely my own. Well, so, you know, it is really hard to make these jokes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm, I, you know what? I'm moving shut right along. Shutting this down. We are moving like the along. Save the silliness for Sunday night. <laughs> this, this will. I can. I know these people, and I know where this is going. So we are shutting it down right you now. You are one of us. Oh, there are too so many dumb too far. in that sentence. Someone's got to be the adult here. Okay. Um, okay. Wait, so can I, Scott, can I, can I, can I, can I, unrelated to Mars? Uh, we had a question, brief question from uh, Guido Bibra uh, about the previous story. What are we going to do without Cassini? Is the mission really ending in 2017? Uh, and then what are we going to do? And I think there's nothing else scheduled to go out to Saturn after Cassini. Cassini's already well into an extended mission, so we are getting way more time than they had originally. A couple done. of extended missions, yeah. Yes. Um, right. um, yeah, eventually Cassini, at the end of its mission, is going to be um, sunk into Saturn, um, similar to um, right. what Galileo did at Jupiter. You know, right. it'll be glorious, but it'll be a sad ending uh, because yeah. we all love Cassini so much. And That's then we'll hear concern. the rumors that it's going to turn Saturn into a second star. <laughs> I, well, mark my words, you've heard it here, right here. Uh, that's a big concern, actually. I think Robert Pavilardo at uh, the uh, AAAS meeting uh, voiced concern that uh, we're really going to go radio dark in the outer solar system once Cassini and Juno uh, bite yeah. the dust. So yeah. uh, all we've got is New Horizons and uh, Pluto. So don't don't be so quick to throw Pluto, Pluto out of the fold. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you speaking of Pluto, you had something a note about their moons, Alan. Oh yeah. Uh, so as you remember, there was this uh, project called Pluto Rocks, uh, which let uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people vote to uh, uh, what to tell people and tell the scientists on the discovery team what their favorites were for uh, naming the uh, fourth and fifth moons of Pluto, uh, P4 and P5. And the favorites turned out to be Vulcan and Cerberus. And uh, Vulcan, of course, is where Mr. Spock is from, and so William Shatner gave that name a big boost, and it turned out to be the, the number one choice by a long shot. Yeah. So uh, the question was, well, are they actually going to suggest these names? because there are a few problems uh, with each of those names. One is that Vulcan was the name of the supposed planet that was inside the orbit of Mercury until they figured out that general relativity was a better explanation for what the orbit of Mercury was doing. And so uh, that they wondered if the IAU, which is the body that approves these names, would go for Vulcan. And then Cerberus, there's already an asteroid named Cerberus. And so mm. it's not a slam dunk that they would have gone with these names, but uh, it turned out word bubbled up that they are indeed proposing those names to the IAU. And, and I have to say that, that Nature's Alex Witsey uh, had had uh, this indication from IAU sources and so I just followed up with Mark Showalter from the SETI Institute and he said yes that is the case that even though Vulcan is the god of fire and uh, it's a little problematic to name an ice ball after the god of fire uh, he's making the argument that Vulcan did live under a volcano so technically he, he lived in the underworld and he was something like a nephew to Pluto so there's a family mm -hmm. connection there and in terms of Cerberus what you could do is change the spelling of the name for example there's another moon of Pluto that's called Nix but they spell that N-I-X because there was also already an asteroid named after uh -huh. the Egyptian uh, after the Greek god of the night uh, N-Y-X and so if you name it Kerberos with a K you might be able to get around that uh, potential confusion problem but it it might not be too long and we'll hear the official word from the IAU about uh, what they're going to go with and so we may have a uh, Vulcan in the family uh, coming up so live long and prosper Pluto and its moons I think I think it's they should have waited but to, you know to use the Vulcan like wait for a bigger object a better you know a more appropriate place for Spock's homeworld you know well, either a, there's an extra solar a, yeah. planet uh, at Epsilon Eridani or you know what I mean like that's what yeah. I, that's what I would do I, I know exactly what you mean that uh, there's not going to be a bigger object unless planet X uh, is found somewhere in the Oort cloud <laughs> in our own so exist, solar people. system <laughs> yeah yeah so so it, but I know what you mean about that whole issue of exoplanet naming and that's another whole it's topic. just such a tiny little just a tiny little moon of yeah. Pluto that that, yeah. you know, it's such a, I mean, well, once it, William I mean, Shatner piped up on Twitter, I mean, that was it, you know, yeah. the whole thing yeah. Yeah. really grew rocket wings. It, 
and I think for the Denny people, Crane bump. I think for people who think that that it's not appropriate to name astronomical objects after popular TV shows, think about the moons of Uranus, which are named after Shakespeare's plays, right? True. Uh, so, but uh, but uh, with with Pluto's moons, they're uh, they're typically named after Roman or Greek uh, mythological figures, and it mm -hmm. just turned out that Vulcan is a dual use name because it's not only Mr. Spock's planet, but it's also the uh, the god of fire in mythology. So they were able to make that case. Right. Uh, okay. Well, we're going to move on. Scott, you've got observations of Betelgeuse using a radar array. Yes, um, with you know Betelgeist or Betelgeuse, it's you know up in Orion, and it's around 640, 650 light years away from us. So it's actually really, really close, and it's this huge red supergiant. But there's they've been using um, a radar array uh, with no. Emerlin over. I... <laughs> Stop saying radar, both of you. Radio. Rain, no, radio. Oh, radio. Ray, excuse me. <laughs> radio ray. Sorry. Put it into my head. Did I blame him? <laughs> right. My fault. All right. Well, here's here's an image radar. of the Radar. a beam out and then it back. Yeah. So this is showing the, the different observatories all over England with E. Merlin. Um, and E. Merlin stands for the Multi-Element Radio Linked Interferometer, uh, Interferometer Network. And so what is actually being observed here is that far larger than the, the optical um, observation of the star. You're seeing the atmosphere so far out. And there's a couple images released by the University of Manchester about this. And it just gives you a little bit of insight because it's such a huge star anyways. It's much, much larger than the sun. But you can see here this, um, this little circle right in the center is what we can see in, in visible light. And this is all of the atmosphere itself puffed out into space. It's so much larger than what we can see with visible light. And, you know, it's not, you know, able to be seen in invisible light. We have to actually see it in, um, in radio. And to uh, have another bit of context to it, we can see our solar system placed inside of this. So here's Neptune and Uranus and Saturn and Jupiter all the way inside just the atmosphere of, of Betelgeuse. And we're seeing something a little interesting up here with this, the atmosphere actually being slucked out, and it's really hot, you know, hot as far as space goes. It's, it's around 150 Kelvin, and there's so much of it, and they're, um, they're seeing around three Earth masses every year is being jettisoned out of the star itself from just from the solar wind that are coming from it. So it's really interesting in how they're able to get a lot of this new data coming through with such a difficult way. And I know um, Nicole can go in a little bit of detail about how hard it is to get such a detailed analysis of, of a star like this using interferometry and radio light. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean the, the power of, of radio interferometry is that you can you can get these very high spatial resolution images. You can actually resolve uh, what's happening around the star, but it, it's difficult. And in particular with E. Merlin, um, it's it's a it's a I think they're using long base a very long baseline interferometry techniques, and so um, they're all different antennas, and so you have to calibrate the whole system, and they're not identical, and that makes it a little bit uh, a little bit more difficult as well. If you're not familiar, if you're watching and you're not familiar exactly where Betelgeuse is or Betelgeuse is or however you want to pronounce it, it's the very, very visible uh, top left star in the uh, shoulders of Orion. So it's, you can see it in the image right there. So right. it's something that's you know very much a visible star in the night sky for uh, for much of Earth. And, and it it's go going to go. Yeah, it's gonna go supernova. Not might. It's going to in the you know, next few million years. Million years, right. Yeah, maybe tomorrow, maybe 10 million years. Do we know if we're looking at Betelgeuse, 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 uh, uh, you did ed, that edge on? <laughs> Is it edge on or are we looking at it? There's uh, no disc, really. I mean, it's, right. it, it's, it's all sloughing off. Be, because the density of it, so, you know, it's just so out there. Because it's it's such a large star that stellar winds are, are going off in all directions and that's what's going to end up polluting the space around it. So no planets, no planets around there. Not that I know of. Inside the star. Um, 
All right, let's I mean, move that's on. That's where Vulcan uh, is, is inside of Beta. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's right. So, Nancy, uh, we've got a story from you about the progress arriving at the International Space Station, not without a hitch. Yeah. Well, uh, shortly after the Russian Progress 51 launched from uh, Russia, or the Kazakh, uh, Baikonur Kazakhstan, Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, thank you. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, people in Mission Control realized that one of the docking antennas wouldn't deploy. And so there was um, some initial doubt about its ability to dock. Uh, one, because this is one of the very crucial um, antennas for docking. It helps keep the, the ship oriented to the station uh, using the KERS automated docking system. And uh, and then two, also because this wasn't deployed, it was kind of stuck in the spot where the uh, where progress would come together with the space station. And uh, of course, uh, some news sites were saying the ship was lost and all the supplies and equipment would never reach the station. People were going to be in bad shape, all this kind of stuff. But I was pretty certain that uh, they'd figure out something. And basically, all they did was send a software pack uh, patch up to. Uh, the progress and uh, one of the other antennas was able to do what this one normally does and uh, so um, this morning it uh, approached normally and actually they ended up docking successfully two minutes earlier than they uh, than they you know had planned and it was kind of funny though um, it was you know they did a soft dock at first just to make sure that this wasn't going to be a problem when they when they got the two really close together and the funny thing was that they uh, to make sure things weren't getting wrecked they asked the astronauts and cosmonauts to listen to see if they heard any funny sounds you know so oh that's something this. you want to hear yeah are you hearing any funny sounds and they said no so just the, voices. Uh, the, the crew is uh, right now unloading the progress so everything turned out just fine uh, and that is not the only story in space flight news this week. We've got the uh, the Antares launch, which is actually a really exciting development. I know, Matthew, you, you tried to watch it. Oh, you're muted. Matthew, ah, there we go. Here. <laughs> yeah, well, I was trying. I was trying to bring up the. Uh trying to bring up the uh, image. This is a photo I took, actually. I, I went there for the first scheduled launch on Wednesday of last week, um, which was the first of two aborted launches. That one, um, they, they called it off at the uh, T-minus 12 point because a, an umbilical cable, data cable connecting the second stage disconnected early. That kind of thing happens, but of course you can't launch the rocket if you don't have all the cables uh, attached when they need to be. But the launch went off on the third attempt on Sunday without a hitch. It was one of those absolutely perfect launches. Nothing went wrong as far as I as far as anybody I've talked to can tell. Um, but the Antares rocket is a is actually a general purpose rocket. Um, the the first purpose to which it'll be put is resupplying the space station, um, making it one of several vehicles, including Progress, uh, designed for that purpose. But um, Antares is also uh, general purpose enough that it could, it will, uh, could conceivably carry much uh, bigger payloads in the future. Um, one of the test uh, devices, it actually three test devices that had as payload during the test launch was uh, uh, it, it contained three phone sats which are small uh, cube satellites containing uh, Android cell phones. Um, these are basically in Sputnik mode right now. All they're doing is sending back uh, a signal to Earth uh, your pre-programmed signals. They're not doing anything new. They're not being told anything. So it's one-way communication. But the fact is, these are little bitty. These are 10 centimeters on the side. So... Uh, um, yeah, cube sets are awesome. They are very cool. Um, in fact, I, I, I tried to, to carry off one that they passed around to the media people at the event, but they wouldn't. They, they, they saw it under my coat, so I didn't get to carry it home. <laughs> but, uh, but, but no, this don't is. Don't say it's, such things on, on live broadcast. I probably should have talked about it. Should have. Um, Stop trying to root the creeps at, all right? I know yeah, what you're yeah. trying to do. <laughs> um, 
So, so if uh, the the NASA guy that I talked to is listening, I'm sorry for joking about such things. Please don't uh, deny me access in the future. <laughs> but, but in any case, uh, but these are really interesting things, and and we'll be hearing more about CubeSats uh, as as more of them are deployed. But I think what's you know what's really interesting about this is this is another private rocket company, right? This is Orbital Sciences, sort of in the same right. vein as as what's happening with SpaceX with with Elon Musk's SpaceX. So you've got, I mean, this this whole private space launch space is really starting to to open up now with multiple groups developing fairly low cost uh, rocket companies, rocket solutions, and this is really going to take all of, you know, communication satellites, space exploration, private space launches, just to the next level. So I think this is fantastic, and there's, yeah, there's a lot of real sort of great things happening in this marketplace now. Yeah, and, and Orbital's been cool. around for 20 years, too. That's no, another but just thing the, to you know, the Yeah, but the, right. the fact that they, they launched it, right, and it's a pretty beefy rocket. It is, yeah. And I, I love the fact that it's becoming so much easier for smaller groups to be able to send payloads up there with it, you know, with Android and Arduino being able to do CubeSats and sending things up and do having small little research projects and just being able to group everything together and send it up, you're so many more people are able to do, you know, do science in space that you never thought would ever be possible because, you know, you're thinking just governmental space yeah. agencies are the only ones able to do research and now it's really open to the public. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can use a cube, you can put together CubeSats like Lego blocks too. For example, Planetary Resources talked about their plan to fly, fly uh, a prototype uh, instrument test package uh, into space next year and what they're doing is taking three uh, of these uh, four inch by four inch or ten centimeter, ten centimeter by ten centimeter CubeSats, putting them together and then just stuffing them with with the equipment that they want to test. So you've got uh, Lego land in space. <laughs> we, have, we have a question from Kelsey Jewett asking, what about more space junk? Is this going to create a lot more space junk with all this stuff going out? Ooh, that's I guess a good question. I mean, it depends on the orbit, right? I mean, if the orbits are fairly low Earth orbit and if the spacecraft isn't going to last very long, then it won't be a long-term problem. If they're mm -hmm. a higher orbit, they can last years or even decades. So, but there will be more space junk. I mean, there, you know, we are with launch costs coming down, you know, SpaceX wants to bring the cost of launch down by what, a factor of 10? And then at the same time of these new, this miniaturization of spacecraft and the, just the, the cheapening price, I mean, the price yeah. for satellites is now dropping by a factor of 10. And it's getting to the point now where average groups could get together and launch spacecraft. So yeah, absolutely, more space junk. I, more space junk, but I'm also. I, it was a few months ago we actually did a story in the weekly space hangout and how you're. They're actually trying to go through and, and gather up stuff that can be recycled and be reused. And you know, even though it's older technology, well, that's an idea use... to do it. That's not a <laughs> yeah. it's feasible right. technology. Yeah. But it's yeah. still something that you might be able to do something with at some point. They've also talked about you know deorbiting some of these piece larger pieces using ray, uh, lasers and all sorts of fancy stuff like that. So, you know, there may soon be a way that, you know, we can start cleaning these things up. Pew, nice. pew. Yeah. <laughs> this is an actual, by the way, this is an actual CubeSat that I got to hold. So that's my hand Pumpkin? in the picture. Pumpkin, yes. I, I love that. And I also like the fact that it says consult user manual prior to operation. <laughs> Before you launch this, read the instructions. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it would be cool to market replicas of that. I wouldn't mind yeah. having a little cube set on my desk, even if it's, you know, just a fake one. A little pencil sharpener. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, moving on, we, we're not, actually not doing too badly now. Um, we've got uh, Hubble observations of Comet Ison, oh, the yeah. comet of the century. Yeah, so one of these big comets that's coming in uh, was imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. I think I'm screen sharing now. Yep. Um, so this is, you know, the best look we have at the comet so far. It's on its way uh, into the inner solar system. When do we think it's going to be um, visible? I don't remember. November. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, what they found is it's it's kind of it, the body of it is kind of a small comet. Um, it's three to four miles across. Uh, the the actual rocky. I'm, I'm using my hands uselessly back here. <laughs> um, but it, it's about three to four miles across uh, the nucleus of the comet, and then the the, the coma bit is about three thousand miles across. So one point two times the width of 
Australia. So imagine a glowing Australia moving through the solar system, and that's about the size of uh, Comet Ison's coma. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, and uh, Dust Hail extends 57,000 miles. Now, Alan, I know you report on this story as well. Uh, do, do the Hubble observations have any impact on sort of the predictions that this will be the comet of the century? Actually, there are, there's a, a debate about that because the nucleus is so small, some people are thinking that uh, this is not a good sign for having a spectacular comet because there's just not enough there there. There's a possibility that the, the thing could uh, crumble, break up as it goes around the sun. Uh, so uh, the, the fact that the nucleus is relatively small is leading some people to wonder, well, gee, that's, that's great that uh, such a small nucleus is able to uh, present such a large amount of activity right now, but how much staying power is it going to have? So that, that's a big issue. It could pull a love joy. I mean, you know, yeah. just pop around the other side and put on a great show as it heads yeah. up. Oh, or it could pull in common, common Elenin. I think you mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Comet, uh, the Doomsday Comet that right. uh, met its doom early, and not um, destroy yeah. the Earth. And, and speaking of that, there are some Doomsday and conspiracy theories out there about Comet Eisen. And uh, so David Dickinson for Universe Today is going to be having an article debunking oh. all the nonsense. On awesome! So, hey, Dave, you are awesome. Oh, that's going to be fantastic! Please, yeah. I can't wait for Dave to do that. Yeah. Dave's great. Aw, yeah. he's taking yeah. over Ian's old dude. And Dave, I think David's going to be joining us in future space yeah. hangouts, and he's yeah, yeah, he's yeah. fantastic. He he also helps us on the virtual star party, so he is in all places everywhere, and is great. I see Alien is going to be on November twenty eighth. So I just looked that up, so that's it's going to come within um it's going to come within eight hundred thousand miles of the sun. So that's really really close. Yeah. Um, but that's uh that's when it makes Such it close. Such a little ball of ice. Uh, so, Nancy, uh, can you talk about the grasshopper test, which yeah. is also awesome. This is a great week for space, i got to say. This is very cool. So Yeah, this is, this is really fun. Um, SpaceX wants to eventually to be able to land uh, vertically on land and not splash down in the ocean. And so they're working on uh, what they call the grasshopper. It's a 10-story uh, a high rocket that uh, just basically it's a, a, a vertical... Oh, shoot, I forgot the... takeoff and landing? Landing, yes, that's what it is. And so basically they go up and hover a little bit and then they go down. And so um, earlier this week they did the um, the highest one that they've done yet and they had some really cool footage because they have... Uh, SpaceX, of course, has all the gadgets. I can and show it if so, you want. Yeah. Play that. You want to show it? Okay. I've and, muted the sound, so... Okay. And... Uh, Anyway, SpaceX has a hexacopter, and they had a, um, a camera on board, and so you have the footage of it from above, and, and uh, so it's just kind of hovering, and it's cool. You can watch it here. Oh. And, um, so watch out, if you, if you watch out helicopter. Sound, if you yeah. play with sound, they're playing Ring of Fire. Over yeah, you've got to make so. sure you watch the original. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it flew up to um, 250 meters, uh, which is a... 820 feet. That's the highest it's gone so far. This is its fifth test flight. And um, uh, Elon Musk said via Twitter that it was actually kind of a windy day and uh, it, and it was a really good test because... Is hanging it's, there? Yeah. It's coming it was, down. Yeah. So, it, it, um, wow. it, it actually like the was, on the bottom. It actually was really stable even though it was kind of windy. And so they were very pleased with that. And then it, you know, it just lands nice and softly. So Are that's you freaking kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. That. That's exactly <laughs> so, what I said when I watched that. <laughs> I'm flailing. You can't see me flailing, but I'm flailing. Oh yeah. wow. That's, that's a, yeah. that is just amazing. What? But but and I mean. So, oh, go ahead, Nancy. Okay, I was just going to say that the uh, Grasshopper is made out of a Falcon 9 first stage tank, a Merlin 1D engine four steel and aluminum landing legs with hydraulic dampers. So that's what it is. And the dreams of every 1950s science fiction author. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they, they, they usually have a uh, cowboy mannequin uh, sitting on the platform, so I'm yeah. curious what happened to the cowboy in the wind. Oh, my God. <laughs> so what are the practical uses of the grasshopper? I mean, it seems like, you know, a very fuel inefficient way to launch a rocket to have it land. I mean I know that like one of Elon Musk's big 
concerns about the whole space launch thing is is that you know it's not the price of fuel for getting things into orbit. The fuel is only a couple hundred thousand dollars for a for a rocket. It's the price of the rocket itself, which is essentially disposed of after after every launch. You know, you're taking imagine every time you you know drove your car for groceries, you threw it out and bought a new one. So, right. you know, that's you just, the problem. You just answered your own question, Fraser. That that's well, why they're doing the grasshopper. Well, I, under, I understand, but but I guess the but to take that thing and to be able to have it go up is is one thing. To have it be able to kind of come back down and land is a is a whole other whole well, other I think world. The Would first still... thing that the first thing that they want to be able to use it for is maybe the not for takeoffs, but for landing. They want to be able to have um, you know like the dragon to be able to land. On land, vertically. Right, but I, I'm so just they wondering would... if if a rocket can have can have enough fuel to go all the way up into orbit, release whatever its payload is, and then deorbit itself, and then land again. Essentially, you're needing double the fuel, right? Yep. But I think Unless... the point the point is to go somewhere and then be able to come back. That yeah, that, that's the, that's the aim. That's why uh, Elon is doing it is because he he wants to get to that point where you have true reusability of the first stage, a uh, first stage that flies it back to the the launch pad. Uh, and so, yeah, you're right that it's going to take uh, some more work to be able to to do all the logistics you need to do to have enough fuel left. But that right. that's why he's doing it. On our right. fuel stations. Right, I understand. So you could yeah. right. So you could have that first stage launch off, give as much velocity as it can to the rest of the rocket, and then detach, and then it just returns yeah. perfectly back to its landing site. So yeah, that actually does make sense. Although you could just turn it into a theme park ride, slim pickings <laughs> from uh, yeah. Strange Love, and just ride it off. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Man. Okay, so I think the last story that we wanted to cover oh, was just several more. <laughs> I know. I, I'm well. The one that I've got on my list still mm -hmm. is the lunar eclipse that happened just a couple of days ago. We've got some just a few pictures. I know there was can... a lunar eclipse. Yeah, Yay. on the twenty fifth. Um, so it was a very tiny lunar eclipse. Only a little bit of the moon was actually um eclipsed uh into shadow. So uh, there's a whole series of pictures over on Universe Today where you can see this brief partial eclipse. Um, there's a, I like this one with the uh, plane flying through it, and so you actually get uh, the plane and the contrail in it. Um, that's pretty much it. I think there was an amusing tweet from, I don't remember which organization, saying that the, the full moon coincided with the lunar eclipse, and a bunch of us giggled because that's the necessary for <laughs> yeah. eclipse, it has to be a full moon. Uh, but that's okay. That only happens once every lunar eclipse. Once every lunar yeah. eclipse. So go to Universe Today. I will put this link in the comments as well and check it out. Um, like I said, it, it's just a little tiny bit of the limb of the moon was covered, so not not terribly dark, but there was one. Um, there was two more things I wanted to mention. One, uh, because Amy unfortunately had to drop out because she was having sound issues. Uh, she wrote she wanted to talk about Mars One, which is the uh, Dutch reality TV show to be set on Mars. Uh, they oh, did a press that would have been cool. They did a press conference earlier this week, and I'll put the link again for her story. Uh, basically, she she told me to tell everyone that they are being a little bit uh, unrealistic. Um, they, they, they claim that the technology already exists to do this entire mission, and they seem to be dodgy about the funding sources. So uh, mm. she wasn't terribly impressed by their press conference, and so I'll include that link as well. Where um, will you get $100 yeah. billion? Dollars? Yeah. One hundred billion dollars. They're saying they're saying six. Six billion. That's what they said. Six billion. Like, yeah. What? Um, and then one other cool thing I wanted to share is um, advertising. Yeah. This uh, there was a contest that happened um, in New York, and I think the the uh, international part of the contest is called the Space Apps Challenge. Uh, is happening next week, and I think we will have uh, the winner of the New York version on uh, Learning Space on Wednesday talking about this. And so he made this really cool app that I'm going to share that shows you all the locations. Uh, from what I can tell, I think this is all the locations on the sky that are being looked at by various space telescopes over the next some period of time. Uh, I don't know entirely what time period it is, but all those blue dots are, are Herschel, which is an infrared observatory. And so you can see all the spots that they'll be looking at. Uh, Suzaku is uh, X-ray, I think. 
Um, where's Hubble? Hubble is green. I'm not seeing it. It's like one green spot. So he's gone through and picked up all of the observing schedules for these space telescopes and is showing you what is being looked at in the sky. That's really cool. Which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Okay. Now are we now are we caught up? Have we got any questions that people want to uh, hit us with? One question I wanted to bring back from the Beetlejuice story um, from Rob Kroll, asking if we know how many visible naked eye stars can turn supernova. Um, and I don't know the number precisely, but a large number of the stars that we can see with the naked eye are large stars because of the larger the star is, the brighter it is, the further away we can actually see it with our naked eye. Um, so any star that's above eight solar masses is going to go supernova, and I don't know offhand how many that is out of the visible stars, but that's quite a lot because, like I said, by nature, the, the, the stars we can see with our eyes tend to be the big ones. Right. There's a bias there. Um, but most of those aren't going to go boom anytime soon. Unfortunately, like, we'd love it. We'd yeah. love it if they would. Yes. We want to see one go boom. Yeah. And none of them are close enough that they would really cause damage. To so, uh, Insider PWH asks, what is the ultimate goal of the Grasshopper demonstrations? It's not just mm -hmm. to show off, is it? And I, I think that's what we're getting at, right? Which is that that the the goal of SpaceX, the ultimate goal is to come up with a completely reusable spacecraft that that they can launch and then re and then just fill it with fuel again and launch again and then fill it with fuel. And but it's it really is pushing the very limits of material science and and so I think they're breaking it up into bits and pieces and in this case, you know, let's try and get that first launch stage reusable. So yep. this particular launch just showed that particular test just showed that they could reach uh, a, a height higher than they had reached before and still land safely and you know and right. vertically. So that's what this last launch was. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because you were saying it was windy, and you can actually see the effects of the wind on the on the craft itself, and the way they were able to correct all the way down. That was just phenomenal feat of engineering, let alone just how cool it was. Yeah. So, like, we could we? So, I mean, Alan, could you imagine? You know, in the next few years, we might see like another stage perched on top of it, and then the whole thing is, you know, used in a launch. Well, sure. I mean, uh, uh, SpaceX is upgrading its uh, Falcon 9. It, it's going to have uh, what they call uh, 2.0 uh, coming up for the for the Dragon. And so you might see more of an incremental uh, application of different uh, technologies that kind of get you to that point where you see the Red Dragon landing on Mars and the, and the stages that fly themselves back to the launch pad. So uh, Grasshopper is kind of a test bed for those sorts of technologies. All right. Well, I think we're, I think we're sort of nearing our hour, so we why, don't we, why don't we wrap this up? Um, we fit all those stories in an hour. That was a lot of stories. Yeah. That was good. That was fast. I hope people, you know, were able to hang on for the ride. Uh, so let's, let's kind of go around, and we'll make sure that people know where to find out more about all of the journalists who participated today. So first, uh, our, we'll go backwards now. So Alan Boyle, uh, where do we find out more... Alan Boyle. Well, you can go to cosmiclog.com, uh, space. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's try science.nbcnews.com or uh, B zero Y L E on Twitter. So there you go. Facebook, all, right. all the usual places. Yep, and Google Plus. Google Plus. Yep. yep. Uh, Scott Lewis, where do we find out more, Scott? Everywhere. Uh, let's see here. Knowthecosmos.com. I'm the Bald Astronomer on Twitter, uh, Facebook to a lesser extent. Um, I also with the Virtual Star Parties on mm -hmm. Sunday, and I also have a, another show this Sunday before the Virtual Star Party with my co-host Boudini um, with Dr. Vincent, um, I will mispronounce his name horribly, but of uh, we're doing one with Science Sunday on virology. So awesome. All over the place. Nice. Uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Hi, I am Noisy Astronomer, and I work for CosmoQuest. Find out all the cool stuff we do at CosmoQuest.org. We have a bunch more shows coming up this week, like Learning Space, which I mentioned on Wednesday. Um, and Pamela Gay and I are also planning uh, for the weekend of June 15th, a 24-hour hangout-a-thon. Uh, so there'll be more details coming up about that uh, in the coming weeks. Yikes. Yeah. Fundraiser hangout. We are going to go crazy online 
for you. And we are going to watch it happen. Yep. You're going to be part uh, of it, Fraser. I know, I know. You're going to rope me in. I know. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to help. Uh, Nancy Atkinson, where do we find out more about you? You can find me at Universe Today, mostly. I'm also at the NASA Lunar Science Institute podcast, and I have a new podcast out today where I interviewed the author of The Overview Effect. So that's there. I'm at Nancy underscore A at Twitter. I'm also on Facebook and Google+. Plus. Awesome. Dr. Matthew Francis, where do we find out more? Um, primary site is bowlerhatscience.org. That's pretty much my the go-to place where you can find all my Twitter, uh, G+, Facebook, uh, cat. cat. Pardon tail. me. Here is, yeah. you feel like this is home. Pascal. Hello. Say hello to the nice people, Pascal. Um, <laughs> next time, shut the cat out. Um, yeah. You can also find me this week only me. at The New Yorker, uh, but also... Uh, uh, Ars Technica, and my blog is at galileospendulum.org. Awesome. And Jason Major? I live over at lightsinthedark.com. I'm also on Universe Today. I write for Discovery News Space, and I'm on Twitter at JP Major, and Facebook, and Google+, and all sorts of other fun places like that. And here on the Weekly Space Hangout. On the Weekly Space Hangout. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and uh, we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.